Now you're playing with power. Nintendo Entertainment System power. Joystick. For millions of gamers, when they first played Nintendo Entertainment System is the world-changing moment that caused them all to fall in love with video games. The NES is so amazing and influential that it is impossible for me to list all the essential games in just one video. So this video is going to cover these essential games that were designed and published by Nintendo themselves. These are the ones that I would recommend that you start with, and in future videos, I'm going to go over essential NES games made by other game companies. While it might seem like some of these games are completely obvious inclusions, so much of Nintendo's games for the NES became absolute classics in their times. So these are the essential games that I would absolutely recommend that you start with, or the ones that you need to rediscover for the first time in years. You know, you want to be one of the retro video game cool kids and like this video. Then you can make Saturday morning rad again by subscribing to this channel because that's when new 8-bit joystick retro video game videos drop. Now, on to the games. Super Mario Brothers. Hands down, this is Shigeru Miyamoto's most influential game, and that's saying quite a lot. It is a groundbreaking side-scrolling action game. Super Mario Bros. set the standard for side-scrolling platformers with its easy-to-learn but difficult-to-master gameplay. It greatly pushed forward the concept of running and jumping in video games. It pushed the boundaries about what was possible on the basic NROM cartridge. That is the basic early Famicom slash NES cartridge without any memory mapper chips. Super Mario Bros. featured intuitive level design that teaches you how to play the game with secret warp pipes, hidden power-ups, and varied enemies. It offers exploration and challenge. Super Mario Bros. became a national pastime in Japan. People sold books on it. It was an incredible craze. And it heavily influenced video game design by adding a direct feeling of control of your character in the middle of the jump, thus greatly expanding how you interact with the jump. I mean, sure it's not the most realistic physics, but it's fun, and that's what video games are all about. A lot of people don't know this, but the graphics tech and the graphics engine for Super Mario Bros. was actually first developed for Excite Bike and Nintendo figured out how to do smooth hardware scrolling on the Famicom slash NES hardware on Excite Bike, which influenced Super Mario Bros. While it's true that Mario existed as a character before this game, this is the game that turned Mario into an international superstar that has lasted for decades. Super Mario Bros. deserves every single bit of praise, and it is a masterpiece in just 32 kilobytes of read-only memory. It's probably the most common Nintendo Entertainment System game, but it is absolutely essential. Duck Hunt The Super Mario Bros. Duck Hunt Combo Cart sold so many NES systems in 1988 as a pack-in. It was included with the NES, the Zapper, as the NES action set. It's the one that I had, and I loved it. Duck Hunt really was an innovative use of peripherals. The NES Zapper, a light gun controller, which was actually a light sensor, was way more successful in the US than Japan. Duck Hunt appealed to people who didn't previously play video games, like my dad. My dad could play Duck Hunt. It is simple and addictive. Duck Hunt's core loop is shooting ducks with the NES Zapper and it is incredibly satisfying. Having an NES Zapper and a CRT is irreplaceable because the light gun is actually a light sensor and it uses the refresh rate of the CRT. That's why you should probably have a CRT to play Duck Hunt and the Wiimote and the mouse just does not cut it. The game has colorful pixel art, a goofy dog, and is instantly recognizable and holds a special place of gaming nostalgia. 
A lot of people credit Super Mario Brothers, but the combination of Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt really helped sell the NES. Donkey Kong Classics is a combination of Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. Donkey Kong is the game that the Famicom was designed to play. Quite literally, Hiroshi Yamauchi told his engineers, you need to build a game system that can play Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong has three unique stages, one less than the arcade version, but each one has its own challenge, such as avoiding barrels and jumping over fire. The NES version doesn't have some of the cutscenes and sound effects as the arcade game, but it is a still fun and important title for in a real piece of video game history, and it should be checked out by anyone who's interested in the evolution of platform games and of Nintendo's history. The NES wouldn't have happened without the Famicom. Donkey Kong on Famicom is the reason why the Famicom exists. Also included is Donkey Kong Jr. Donkey Kong Jr. is a role reversal. It flips the script from the original Donkey Kong, casting Mario as the bad guy antagonist, and Donkey Kong Jr. as a hero on a quest to rescue his captured father. The core mechanic revolves around climbing up and down vines, adding a new layer of strategy and dropping fruit on these little mechanical traps that Mario will unleash. It is short but sweet and definitely out of the era of early 1980s arcade titles where everything was just long enough. While it's not as punishing as some contemporaries, Donkey Kong Jr. can provide some stiff challenge, but it is an incredible piece of Nintendo history and it is absolutely essential to play on the NES. The Legend of Zelda The Legend of Zelda shattered expectations by offering a vast open world to explore at your own pace. Unlike many linear games of the era, players were free to roam around Hyrule discovering secrets and dungeons in any order. It has simple yet deep gameplay. The game's core mechanics are easy to grasp, attack enemies, collect items, solve puzzles. However, mastering these elements strategically and using items adds depth and really rewards exploration and experimentation. The game was a launch title for the Famicom Disk System. It made full use of the disk card's media advantage over traditional ROM cartridges with an increased size of 128 kilobytes, and it also had the ability to save game data to the disk card. Of course, when Nintendo would bring this out to the US, they would develop a cartridge which could simulate the Famicom Disk System's ability to save by having a memory backup using a battery to keep a little bit of information in RAM. The Legend of Zelda greatly expanded on what was possible in Nintendo games. It was influenced by Namco's Tower of Daruga action RPG, and The Legend of Zelda itself influenced other games. The Legend of Zelda was principally inspired by Shigeru Miyamoto's exploration of a young boy of the hillsides, forests, and caves surrounding his childhood home in Sonobe, Japan. The Legend of Zelda has a real sense of progression and reward. Finding weapons, uncovering hidden dungeons, defeating bosses offers a constant sense of progression and accomplishment. The game rewards exploration with valuable items, heart containers that can increase Link's health. Oh, an interesting thing about the name Link is that initially you were supposed to type in your character's name and it was going to show up in the title crawl during uh, for the Famicom Disk System version. Link is a stand-in for like Data Link and it stuck and he is known as Link to this day. When Nintendo published the game in North America, they brought a fourth battery saves and a gold cartridge. The package design features a small portion of a window cut away to show the unique gold-colored cartridge. The Legend of Zelda was a very special game and Nintendo wanted you to know that. Super Mario Bros. 3 is widely regarded as the greatest NES game. It is an incredible artistic and technical achievement. 
Super Mario Bros. 3 was not possible on earlier Nintendo hardware and required the more advanced memory mapper chips, which greatly opened up the graphical complexity that designers and programmers could utilize. Technical advances in a medium must happen necessarily before the artistic advances can happen. But Nintendo's R&D team making Super Mario Bros. 3 worked hand-in-hand -hand with the technical teams in making sure that the software had the technical graphics power inside the cartridge to pull it off. It's rather ingenious that instead of upgrading the NES console, they were able to put upgrade chips inside the actual cartridges. Super Mario Bros. 3 and the MMC3 chip were essentially a mid-cycle hardware revision. Super Mario Bros. 3 was one of the first games to use Nintendo's new MMC3 mapper chip, but not the first. Sega's Eight Eyes came out a month earlier. In this game, Mario can explore a large world map, fly with a raccoon tail, and this game has some of the tightest jumping action in any video game. It is the third best-selling NES game and sold more than 17 million copies worldwide. Of course, I'm going to have the holy trinity of Super Mario Bros. games on this list, but if it was up to me, every single NES system would have a copy of this game ready to play. It is that good. Hogan's Alley Hogan's Alley is a light gun shooter game for the NES and it was one of the launch titles for the system in the US. The game presents the player with cardboard cutouts of gangsters and innocent civilians, and the player must shoot the gangsters and spare the innocent people, rewarding fast reflexes and accuracy. There are three gameplay modes. There is a shootout at a static range, shootout at a simulated rolling city street, and shooting cans as a shooting challenge. Overall, Hogan's Alley is charming and historic and it delivers a really good use of shooting action, especially for those who have the zapper. It is absolutely one of my favorite zapper shooting games. A lot of people give attention to Duck Hunt, but Hogan's Alley is right up there for my favorite zapper game. Metroid. Metroid is an action-adventure game originally released for the Famicom Disk System, but the US version uses a password system to save on cartridge. It features non-linear progression. As you explore this alien world, you backtrack to new areas after you've unlocked power-ups that can open up new passageways around the world. There's a really satisfying weapon progression. You find and expand your arsenal of weapons, which expands your abilities and allows you to explore more of the world. Metroid has a really unique atmosphere. It is eerie and isolated environments create a whole bunch of tension and a sense of discovery. So a lot of people think that Samus Aran was the first female character on the cover of a Nintendo game, but it actually was the volleyball player on volleyball for Famicom Disk System who beat her to the punch just two weeks before that. I absolutely love Metroid and I'm glad to see that it's got the recognition that it deserves. The entire concept of Metroidvania is now a genuinely accepted genre of games. Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link is an action role-playing game with platforming elements. It's the second game in the Legend of Zelda series and it was released in Japan for the Famicom Disk System less than a year after the original Japanese release of the first game and seven months before the release of the first Legend of Zelda game in North America. We didn't actually get Zelda 2 The Adventures of Link for an entire two years after it originally released in Japan. It is considered to be the black sheep of the Legend of Zelda series, but it was highly influential in video game design. They went with a different gameplay perspective, and there's the top overworld, but it, when the action switches to side-scrolling gameplay, and it has an experience point system similar to Castlevania II Simon's Quest. 
It has a strategic combat system where you get close and hit the side-scrolling enemies with your sword and then earn experience points which you can then put into your health or magic points or attack. There's a significant change in how Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link progression system between the American and the Japanese version and overall it makes the American version a lot easier. However, this game is very difficult and it's known for an unforgiving difficulty requiring precise jumps and combat requiring the memory of en enemy patterns. And often falling to your death can happen instantly and brutally. So Zelda 2 The Adventures of Link is a cult classic. Despite its difficulty, it really has a cult status for a unique blend of action and RPG elements. It's a unique entry for the Legend of Zelda series and was very influential on later systems with its experience systems and side-scrolling elements, but it's a unique point in the Legend of Zelda series. Excitebike Excitebike is a motocross racing game by Nintendo. It's one of their earlier games from 1985. It had really great Nintendo graphics and really showed off the NES's hardware scrolling ability. The side-scrolling gameplay of Excitebike was key to the development of Super Mario Bros. because it was directed by Shigeru Miyamoto, and the side-scrolling smooth game engine was later used by the Super Mario Bros. team, but it was originally developed for Excitebike. As a consequence, it had Mario smoothly accelerating from a walk to a run rather than move at a constant speed. Excitebike also had an engine temperature mechanics, balancing speed with preventing your engine from overheating. It added a layer of complexity and strategy. It actually had a track editor, which in Japan used the Famicom Data Recorder audio tape drive to save data, but this peripheral was not brought out to the US, so I always wondered what these save and load options were when they were included in the NES cartridge, but didn't do anything. Excitebike is a lot of fun. It is classical Nintendo action. The graphics are great. The gameplay is a ton of fun. Definitely don't miss Excitebike. Super Mario Bros. 2, also known as Super Mario USA. It's almost common knowledge at this point that this game was not originally Super Mario Bros. 2, but a game for the Famicom Disk System called Yumi Kojo Doki Doki Panic. And the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2 for the Famicom Disk System was deemed too difficult and too dated to be the right game to introduce to the American audiences at the time. So Doki Doki Panic was retooled and redesigned and turned into the American Super Mario Bros. 2 for NES. Nintendo actually never reissued Doki Doki Panic, partially because they dislike paying licensing fees for licensed characters that were in the game. So they distributed the NES version Super Mario Bros. 2 in Japan as Super Mario USA on cartridge. While the original Super Mario Bros. 1 and 2 focused on horizontal scrolling, Super Mario Bros. 2 featured vertical scrolling in addition to picking up items and enemies and throwing at them instead of just jumping on them. Verticality was a major part of this game. Climbing and jumping takes priority over running. Levels in this game encourage you to be strategic and to use items to reach higher platforms. The ability to pull up enemies and vegetables adds a new development to the gameplay, using them to clear obstacles, stun enemies, and toss objects at them. There really is a much more of a sense of exploration in this game and the game includes four characters, each with their own ability and play styles. Mario is all around average. Luigi has an incredibly high jump, but is very floaty. Toad can dig incredibly fast, but is vertically challenged when jumping. And Princess Peach can float horizontally over long distances. The original Japanese FDS game required you to play each stage with each character in order to get to a real ending, but it was rightfully abandoned for the international version. Also, you can run. This game features Birdo, who's considered to be the first trans video game character, both in the Japanese manual for Doki Doki Panic and the American description. 
but we should still probably call her Birdetta because that is what the manual says she wants to be called. Despite not starting life as a Super Mario game, it is very influential for the Super Mario series, and the mechanics, characters, and themes in Super Mario Bros. 2 would continue in later games. Wild Gunman is a light gun shooter game by Nintendo, and it was originally an electromechanical arcade game which was launched in 1974 and designed by Gunpei Yakoi. In 1984, the Famicom version was released with the Famicom Beam Gun. It was a plastic western style revolver modeled after the Colt Single Action Army, and it came with a plastic holster belt. Then, when the NES was released in America, it was redesigned as the Zapper. Wild Gunman is simple and classic. It is a light gun game showcasing the Zapper. You pull and fire at targets as they appear on the screen, beat the bad guys to the draw. It has charming Wild West aesthetics, both colorful detailed sprite works, and is really, really just a fun game. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out and Punch-Out. It is a classic arcade action game where you play as Little Mac as he fights big quirky characters and has a really unique playstyle focusing on memorizing opponent's tells and the behavior of each opponent boxer follows a set pattern requiring trial and error and memorization to defeat them. It's almost a rhythm game. It was also the only game that uses the MMC2 mapper chip. Any lag spoils this game, and it is best played on a CRT in my book. Now, licensing issues, or Mike Tyson's legal issues at the time, this affected Nintendo replacing Mike Tyson with Mr. Dream, but the core game remains the same. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out is amazing, and it is absolutely essential. Kid Icarus is a platforming game made by Nintendo originally for the Famicom Disk System in Japan and on cartridge in Europe and North America but with a password. The plot of Kid Icarus revolves around protagonist Pit on its quest to find three sacred treasures which he must equip to rescue the Greek-inspired fantasy world of Angel Land and its ruler goddess Palutena. It is a platform action game fighting monsters and collecting items. Kid Icarus is known for its challenging difficulty and the enemies can inflict heavy damage and their unforgiving boss fights. Despite its difficulty, the game offers a satisfying sense of accomplishment when you finally overcome its obstacles. Nintendo R&D 1 featured Nintendo designer Toru Osawa, who loves jokes about eggplants and created the eggplant wizard character, which may or may not be a secret phallic joke based on the nasu or Japanese eggplant. Or Toru Osawa was just a weird creative guy and I tip my hat to him. The soundtrack is memorable and catchy, and the main theme is a particular standout, which is why I put it on this video. It also sounds a lot different on the Famicom Disk System with the expanded audio support. It's not as popular as Mario, Zelda, or Metroid, but Kid Icarus is a classic NES game which offers its challenges, rewards, and you should definitely check it out. Kirby's Adventure Kirby's Adventure is one of the later games on this list, and it was originally developed by HAL Laboratories, but published by Nintendo. It is the second game in the Kirby series after Kirby's Dream Land on Game Boy, and it is the first game to include the copy ability, which has Kirby able to gain powers by eating certain enemies. Like Kirby's Dream Land on Game Boy, Kirby's Adventure is a side-scrolling platform game. Masahiro Sakurai conceived the copy ability to add more challenge and replay value after the last game had criticism for its simplicity. Dreamland is bursting with vibrant colors and whimsical enemies. It creates a cheerful, inviting atmosphere. The core gameplay revolves around Kirby's ability to inhale enemies and steal their powers, providing a fun and versatile way to approach challenges. Balloon Fight Balloon Fight is an arcade action game developed by Nintendo and HAL Laboratories. HAL Laboratories was actually contracted by Nintendo to develop various prototypes of Atari hits to try and convince Atari to distribute the Famicom in America. 
and one of those games was Joust by Midway. Joust is obviously a huge influence on Balloon Fight, but Balloon Fight has Nintendo fun and charm. Former Nintendo president Iwata programmed Balloon Fight and helped design it. Balloon Fight has a delightful concept. You navigate a little fighter through whimsical skies, popping the opponent's balloons while protecting your own. It really, really shines in multiplayer, and you battle a friend in a frantic, chaotic fight for aerial supremacy filled with laughter and friendly competition. Balloon Fight is easy to pick up and play, and is an absolute great game on NES. Tetris also known as Classic Tetris, is a puzzle game for NES released in 1989 based on Tetris by Alexei Pazhinov. It was published after a legal battle between Nintendo and Atari Games. Bulletproof Software previously made a version of Tetris for the Famicom, and Nintendo had published Tetris for the Game Boy earlier that year. Tetris is simple but addictive, Tetris offers basic but really rewarding classic gameplay where the blocks fall down and you arrange them in patterns to try and make lines without spaces and then the lines clear. Nintendo Tetris for NES is basic but it is an absolute classic and one of the best puzzle games ever made on any platform. Ice Climber Ice Climber is a platform action game where you play two ice climbers as a quest to climb an icy mountain to retrieve vegetables stolen by a giant pterodactyl condor. The ice climbers carry a wooden mallet that they use to carve openings in the ice above and to club enemies. It is two-player simultaneous fun and is a lot of fun with a friend to join up and go up the Ice Climber Mountain. It has a steep difficulty curve. Later levels become really, really hard and there are some unforgivable jumps. The jumping mechanics can feel floaty and a little imprecise because this was pre-Super Mario Bros. jumping. And the story featuring a pterodactyl stealing eggplants from egg climbers, so it features yet more eggplant joke weirdness from the Nasu eggplant loving folks at Nintendo R&D 1. Ice Climber was a launch title for the NES and it is a classic. So why collect and play NES? Well, there is simple addictive gameplay. The NES games focus on pure, unadulterated fun. They are often easy to pick up and play, but challenging to master. It is absolute timeless entertainment. Then there is the nostalgia factor. Relive your childhood memories or discover a new era of gaming for the first time. Wide availability. Nintendo games and consoles are readily available online at retro game stores and even garage sales you can find them still. Durability. The NES is a tank and is known for its sturdy construction and simple design. It is a reliable console that will last for decades. The most that you're going to need to do is to get the internal connectors cleaned or replaced. But it's not rocket science and it's a good hobby project to do. NES games are perfect for short bursts of gameplay. They are ideal for quick pick up and play sessions and they fit perfectly into your busy schedule. Are you making enough time in your schedule for the NES? You should. Endless creativity, the simple graphics and mechanics of the NES encourage repeat problem solving and experimentation. Game developers had some serious technical limitations and they had to be creative in order to design games that were fun and worth playing over and over again. <sighs> Stress relief. Escape the daily grind and unwind with a simple and satisfying gameplay of classic NES titles. It is often a gateway to retro gaming or gateway drug. The NES can be a springboard to explore other retro consoles and gaming era and expand your gaming horizons. Whatever your reason, there are some great reasons to have an NES and to play NES games right now. This guy wanted you to know that we make awesome videos like this each week. 
to make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss out. This is 8 Joystick. Stay awesome. Play retro.